This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. We've got a bunch of stuff to talk about today, so we're just going to jump right in. Henry Smith is here, and Brian Wendell from the Bible Archaeology Report is on the line from Ontario, Canada. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. It's nice to have you again, Brian. Hey, thanks, guys. It's great to be with you again. All right. Speaking of blasphemous things, you're going to use the word Easter for this episode. There's going to be some people who are going to get in trouble with that. Ah, I get in trouble every year when I use that. I'm like, seriously, people, do your research. Oh, uh, it's not Ishtar. Stop it. I know. Um, I just I just got an email berating me about the use of the word Christmas uh, yesterday. So, oh, did you? Yeah. Uh, Most of these things you get immune to in ministry. I've been here almost 20 years now, so... I yeah. kind of, I've learned to get a much thicker skin than when I first started. I would have, re- yeah. 17 years ago, I would have responded. Yeah, I've, I've actually just started turning off the comments on my blog. Oh. I'm like, ah, I don't need to, no. I, I don't have the time to respond to all the, the yahoos out there. Yes. And it's a shame. I don't want to give the impression that I only will allow the blog, because I, I only allow, I, I will allow. I have to approve the comments before they show up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so rather than give the impression that I'm only, you know, approving the good job ones, I, I'm just like, you know, I don't know. And, and part of it is, I think if there was someone who I felt I could have a respectful discourse with, yeah, I, I think I would be, be more open to that. But when someone is basically just questioning your salvation and your ethics and i just like i don't don't have a lot of time to no it's a it's a stewardship wisdom issue your your spiritual energy the time you put into it yeah and most of the time it's just poisoning the well that's why we don't allow the comments on youtube it's just it would just open up a can of worms that you could just you could just never put the genie back in the bottle yeah and and so we just don't do it at all you know yeah so Anyway, okay, you blasphemer, are you ready to talk about Easter? Uh, I'm ready, yeah. And uh, these are, this is not in strict order of priority, just so you guys know. It's it's not. So maybe if you wouldn't mind, Brian, giving us a, kind of your criteria for what made it onto your list. I, I have the list in front of me, and I see there's already one thing that I feel like you've excluded from lists like this before. And so maybe tell us what framework you have for this other than it's related to Easter. Yes. So I, I'm looking at things that have been, um, are related to the, the Easter accounts in the gospel, first of all. And second of all, I'm looking at things that illuminate that story or affirm that account. And, and whenever I use the word story, I'm not using it in a fictional sense. Um, I'm talking about it in a narrative sense. The gospels describe the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the events that Christians for 2,000 years have celebrated at the time that we call Easter now in the spring. And and so I'm looking at archaeological discoveries related to that. And, and with with at least one, if if I'm thinking of the one that you're you're mentioning, you're you're alluding to, I have left it off of some lists in the past because it is controversial and I was not fully convinced about it. And I think the latest research has convinced me of its authenticity. So I've included it on the list. So. Excellente. And so for this list, there's, there's 10 things on your list. It's and, but they're not necessarily in an order of increasing value or increasing evidential rank. rank. Maybe. Yeah. It's uh, it's more, yeah. Cr- more chronological. Is that what you're saying to us earlier? Yeah, so people who are used to my top 10 list know that I like to rank things from least to greatest. And and that, to me, is part of the fun of top 10 lists and comparing my top 10 list to other people's top 10 lists. For me, it's just a lot of fun to see that and see how different people rank things. But when you come to a narrative account, it's hard to do that because what happens is you end up bouncing back and forth through the narrative account based on how significant you feel a certain piece of evidence is. So what we'll do today is instead we'll work our way through the narrative account and we'll, we'll look at, at different discoveries that have been made, things that are related to the Easter account, the accounts of Jesus death and resurrection in the scriptures. 
And um, but we'll do it in a chronological way. I will say though that the top two really are, I think, among the most important ones, and certainly the number one. I think I would put right up there. But yeah, it's going to be more chronological through the events as they happened, beginning with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and working our way through to Jesus' resurrection, the empty tomb, and the testimony of people afterwards. All right. Well, let's get started. What's what's the first thing on your list? Well, I mentioned we're going to start in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, and so um, that's what we're going to talk about to start, the Garden of Gethsemane. It may surprise uh, people to know that the Bible actually never refers to the Garden of Gethsemane by that name. It, it just simply says Jesus and his disciples went to a place called Gethsemane. We're told in Luke twenty two thirty nine that was on the Mount of Olives. John 18, 1 tells us there was an olive grove there, and that makes sense because Gethsemane, the word, means olive press or the press of oils. And uh, today, uh, tourists who go to Israel often enjoy the serenity of the Garden of Gethsemane that's uh, on the Mount of Olives there. It's got these ancient olive trees. Um, now, um, uh, unlike what some people might think or what some tour guides might say, uh, these are not the trees standing that were standing there when Jesus was alive. Josephus tells us that uh, in 70 AD, during the siege of the city, the Romans basically clear-cut all of the olive trees on the Mount of Olives uh, mm. for for their own uh, uses during the siege. So trees were all cut down. However, um, shoots certainly would have grown up out of the stumps. You can still see some of that happening um, in the uh, olive trees. I saw some when I was there last year. So the trees standing there, some of the trees in the current Garden of Gethsemane may be descendants of the trees that Jesus walked among. That could very well be, if indeed that is the area of the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus went to pray and where Jesus was arrested. Now, here's the thing. When I went there this past year, I really wanted to see a particular place, and, and most of the tour groups just walk right past it. But I wanted to see not only the, the Garden of Gethsemane, I wanted to see the Cave of Gethsemane. The Grotto of Gethsemane is literally right across the road from uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And I believe it may actually be the actual site of the betrayal of Jesus, or at the very least, the spot where the, the disciples slept. So we're told, Luke notes that Jesus would spend his nights on the Mount of Olives while he was in Jerusalem, Luke 21, 37. And um, John 18, 18 tells us that it was a cold night. So where were Jesus and the disciples sleeping? It makes sense that they would be in a sheltered area like a cave. But to me, the clincher is this. John 18, 4 says, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Now, Jesus went out of something in the garden. John tells us. What did he go out of? Well, it makes sense that he went out of the cave. Now, Jesus may very well have prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that's currently there. Um, the scripture says that he went a stone's throw away, and and from the entrance to this cave to the Garden of Gethsemane, is literally, I could throw a stone and, and, and get there. Literally, it's a stone throw away. But this um, cave of Gethsemane is very interesting because archaeological excavations have revealed that the cave was used as an olive press in ancient times, uh, the remains of the uh, works that they would have used, the, the holes and, and, and some of the, the slots for the beams are there in that cave. And so uh, the cave of Gethsemane, the cave of the olive press makes sense to me as a place uh, where Jesus likely, his disciples likely slept and uh, where Jesus came out when he met his betrayer and and near where he was arrested. So uh, yeah, the, the Garden of Gethsemane and the Cave of Gethsemane, I think are really important things. There's a great article, by the way, that uh, Joan Taylor has written in Biblical Archaeological Review on the Cave of Gethsemane, I think in 1995. Just, I highly recommend it. It's a great article. I've never really heard of the Cave of Gethsemane before. Yeah, to be honest with you, I mean, that's interesting when you look at the text uh, that shows you how important exegesis is, the 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 diamonds that come out of the the treasures that come out of a careful exposition of a text that makes a lot of sense to me. A couple of thoughts, Brian. One is uh, when we do our dig at Shiloh, we do a tour, do a couple tours, and almost inevitably we take people to Gethsemane, and it's a very powerful experience. 
emotionally for people, especially the first time that they've been there. Yeah. There is something ex existential about being there. Uh, and we think it's pretty accurate. Like this seems to be the right place and the right time. You yeah. know, the other is that imagery of the pressing of the oil. Mm -hmm. I, I just think about the theological imagery of Jesus's uh, struggle at that point and that imagery of he is about to be pressed. Yeah. Crushed. Crushed, crushed for our iniquities. Crushed. Yeah. Right. And that, that imagery of what you see in olive press, the hundreds of pounds that are put on those weights and the weighing down uh, and the oil comes out and then goes down into the uh, into the area that catches it. You know that imagery is so powerful. It's the 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 text is so rich with this this imagery that sometimes we don't see. And then this discoveries outside the Bible help draw it out for us. So yeah, it's it's certainly an important site, and uh, and I think it's it's if it's not the site, it certainly is nearby. Yes. Uh, where I believe Jesus was. Wow, that's really interesting. So what's, what do we have next on your list? Well, after Jesus was arrested, they took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, and he was the one who presided over the trial of Jesus, according to Matthew 26, verse 3, Luke 3, verse 2, John 11, verse 49. And uh, the ancient historian Josephus records that Caiaphas's full name was Joseph Caiaphas, and it appears that he was simply known by his family name Caiaphas kind of in the same way that, that there were lots of different Herods, Herod Antipas, Herod Archelaus, uh, often simply known by, by the name Herod, King Herod. Um, and in 1990, a construction team was building a water park near Jerusalem. And as often happens when they're doing public works uh, in, an, in an ancient area, uh, the uh, bulldozer plowed through the roof of a first century tomb. And when that happens, they, they stop the construction, they bring in the archaeologists and what they discovered were a variety of ossuaries. Now, for our listeners, an ossuary at the time of Jesus, the burial practice was that they would they would lay the body out in a tomb until the body had decomposed. Then they would gather up the bones and they would put them in these limestone bone boxes called ossuaries. And so they discovered an ossuary, a very ornate one. It's in the Israel Museum, Jerusalem. It's beautiful. And on the name of it is Joseph, son of Caiaphas. And inside there were the bones of six people, including those of a 60-year-old man whom scholars believe are the physical remains of Caiaphas himself. And so we have uh, tangible evidence uh, of the historicity, certainly, of someone who plays an, a very important role in the uh, narratives of Passion Week and the trial of Jesus Caiaphas himself. Yeah, I, I love this discovery. I, I often share this one with a uh, youth group at my church or uh, when I speak at my daughter's school because of, I can tell them, you know, as far as we know, this is the only bones of an actual person from the Bible that we actually have, right? So that's yeah. extraordinary. Another, a question that I get often uh, is the crude the crudeness of the inscription itself. And at first, when I was first asked this, it, I, I didn't know quite what to do with it. You would think so, an aristocrat like Caiaphas would have had a, his name etched in there very neatly. Uh, now, some bone boxes are are done that way. Like the James Ossuary, it's pretty mm -hmm. neat. You know, it looks like it was chiseled in very neat. This looks like it was kind of written at the last second almost, right, with a nail or something. And I thought, well, does that comport? But uh, So I reached out to Craig Evans and asked him. His theory is, Maybe someone thought to put the name on the box as they were putting it into the tomb. It's dark. You got to bend down. It's hard to write. Yep. And I thought, okay, I can, I think I can live with that explanation. Yeah. But I was always, I was always struggled with why didn't he have his, if the box was so ornate, why wasn't the name ornate? But um, it doesn't disqualify it, of course, but it, it's an interesting, it, no, no, that's an a good interesting point. question that I've been asked that I kind of have tried to figure out myself. Yeah. Well, and then I know we've talked about this before a little bit on another podcast, but if I'm remembering right, aren't didn't they also find nails inside of this ossuary? Yes, I have heard that, and I have not myself been able to cite that okay. yet, and, okay. and I hope to, but I have heard that. Okay. But I haven't I haven't heard anything else beyond just that being repeated. And one of the things I've learned is that I, I want to be able to go back to original sources. Yes. Of course, yeah. And yes. because there's a there's sometimes well-meaning, very well-meaning people, preachers, uh, even scholars who who repeat things 
But when you try and track down the source of it, it just it, it almost seems like it's one of those urban myths. Yes, we even have those in the church. So hmm. yeah, we, we've yeah. even internally in ABR, we should be transparent at times. I've done that. You know, I hear one yeah. of my colleagues say something and I absorb it and I repeat it. And then, you know, maybe maybe they can justify it or maybe they made a mistake because, you know, no none of us are perfect. We've all said things publicly that are incorrect. And so it's just a, a good reminder to uh, just double check. Uh, yeah. And to be sure, I am intrigued by the the nail question, though. So maybe that's something we could do offline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and to be clear, I'm not saying there wasn't nails found. I've heard people say that. You haven't confirmed um, I just, it. I just, I try to be very careful in my, my research that I can cite something like that. And I just haven't yet got there. So I, I'm something I likely will do when I, when I publish my, my blog coming up for, uh, for this coming Easter. There you go. That's your pastoral wisdom, Brian. <laughs> so after Jesus went to Caiaphas, then where did he go next? Well, Jesus, um, it was a sham trial, uh, as, as anyone who knows anything about, um, trials in the ancient world know, uh, particularly, um, the, the Jewish system, uh, there were all kinds of problems with the way they did it, but they, they, uh, eventually took Jesus to Pontius Pilate to be sentenced to death. And, and all of the gospels declare it was the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who was the one who eventually sentenced Jesus to death. And, um, and listen, Pilate's historicity has never been in doubt. He is mentioned by ancient writers like, uh, Josephus and Tacitus and Philo. Plus he's mentioned in every gospel, uh, account in the new Testament. And so that's not a, a concern, but Archaeological evidence for Pontius Pilate came to light in 1961 when they were doing excavations at Caesarea Maritima. And near the amphitheater, they found this limestone block. It was actually being used in secondary use. So uh, I think it was being used as a step, if I'm not mistaken. And when they, when they pulled it up, they discovered that there was this inscription on it dedicated to Tiberius Caesar. And it said, Pontius Pilate prefect of Judea for something called the Tiberium, I believe is, is what it was. And so, uh, we don't know what the Tiberium was, but, but we have Pontius Pilate and his actual uh, title at the time there. And so it certainly confirms that Pilate was the prefect of Judea governing as the gospel writers described. And then just a, a number of years ago in 2018, a copper ring that had been unearthed in the 1960s and excavations at the Herodium were, was cleaned and photographed and analyzed. And it had a Greek inscription that read of Pilatus. Um, and scholars believe the ring may have once been the property of Pontius Pilate or probably one of his servants um, who would have used it for marking things that were coming or going from Pontius Pilate. And so the Pilate stone for sure, and possibly this Pilate ring provide archaeological evidence for the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate, the man who sentenced Jesus to die by crucifixion. At our uh, excavations at uh, Kerber del Macadar, Brian, we uh, we discovered uh, Pilate coins there in the New Testament uh, era material that we uncovered. Of course, that site we were looking for evidence for the eye of Joshua seven and eight, but there's New Testament village there and found coins. So he had coins minted. Uh, it's really extraordinary. I, I, I was thinking about Pilate just recently from a presentation that I did. I was just thinking about the consequence of the moment that the man is in. Now, no, no one else is going to face a moment quite of that consequence. Yeah. But 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 it's such a, a lesson for for anyone listening to think about the consequence of moments in your life to recognize the fork in the road goes one way or the other. And his yeah. attempt, attempt to be neutral, uh, and and then on top of that, the warning that he received from his wife in terms of the dream, just a, in in some ways a, a despicable character, but a tragic figure as well. You know, it's it's sealed and done now for t almost two thousand years, but it is a reminder to us of there are moments in l the life of every man and woman where there's major forks in the road to take. Don't follow the road that Pilate took. Yeah. But didn't God want him to follow that road? Yes. Are you asking that question? No, I, I just <laughs> are, are you asking? 
Yes, should, as Peter, as Peter got up that one. <laughs> as Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and said, "You crucified the Lord of glory according to the predestined plan of God." And so they were guilty and it was the predestined plan of God. How do you put those two together? Hmm. You can't. <laughs> That's my view. Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Are we supposed to get into that kind of no. theology here? <laughs> it's a little deep. You just start going in circles in your mind. But yes, he was exactly supposed to, but right. he had a choice. But he chose what what God what had destined. God ordained. And then, so, what does that mean? And yes. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, let's let's skip a track and then move on to the <laughs> next thing. Or we're just going to get stuck in a in a loop. So Jesus went and visited Pontius Pilate. That's right. And what happened next, or or where was that? What that where that happened? Yes, yeah, so we're told in the Gospels that Jesus was taken before Pontius Pilate at the palace of the Roman governor in John 18, 28, which was one and the same as the Praetorium, Mark 6, 15, verse 16. And so where is the Praetorium? Where, where would Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, the prefect of Judea, where would he have stayed in Jerusalem when he was there? Where was his Praetorium? And, and some have suggested that He would have stayed at the Antonia Fortress. That was where the Roman soldiers were. Although archaeologist Shimon Gibson has measured the base of the Antonia Fortress, and he thinks it's 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 probably too small to have housed Pilate and all of his entourage and all of the the soldiers. It really was more of an observation post. But today, I think scholars generally have come to a consensus that the Praetorium was actually Herod's old palace conflict uh, complex and so that it was in in that area that Jesus was was sentenced to death by Pilate and the writings of of Philo of Alexandria uh, indicate that Pilate used Herod's old palace as his residence when he was in Jerusalem and, and this isn't this isn't surprising by the way um if if you know a little bit of the history uh, after Herod died Herod the great his son Herod Archelaus reigned in uh, Jerusalem and and he he was such a, a horrible king that um, the Jewish people petitioned Caesar to get rid of him and and when they investigated they found that he he was not governing well and and they basically removed him from from power and Rome took over his all of his assets and so Rome came into control then of the uh, of the palace of Herod, The great. And what's really interesting is that you can actually see part of uh, the palace of Herod the Great. It's in the Tower of David Museum in a place uh, called the Kishla, which is an Ottoman era prison. But uh, at the base of it, you can actually see the foundations of Herod the Great's palace. It's one of the few places where you can see in Jerusalem remains of Herod's palace, which in turn, would have been the Praetorium where Pilate was staying, where Jesus was taken to be tried by Pilate. Hmm. And have, have you been there? I have, yes. And what uh, interesting was that like? story. I, I, was, I went to the Tower of David Museum last year and uh, when we were in Jerusalem, and I wanted to, I asked the person at the gate, I said, look, um, if I pay to get in, can I see the quiche? Look, I want to see Herod the Great's, the remains of Herod's palace. And he said, yes. Uh, because it's not cheap, the Tower of David Museum. So I I, I paid to get in, and, and it, it is a maze to try and find your way there. But I eventually found my way there, and um, the door was locked. And I thought, are you kidding me? I was told I could get <laughs> in here. And so, but there was a keypad there. And, um, and my wife and I were there, and two other gentlemen were there. And um, I will just say, we were in in what I believe is God's, God's smiling upon us. We were able to figure out the code and get in oh. to the Kishla and uh, and see um, the remains of Herod's palace. The lights were on in there, and and I don't know whether the person who was there was just on break or something, uh, but we were able to get in and, and see that. And it, it's quite interesting to look down um, and see the remains of the foundation. There's also a hole there where you can see Herodian masonry and uh, and a channel that they believe is a, is a like a, a septic sewage channel. For the water to run out uh, of the palace there um, as well in that area. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's good stuff. You know, you quoted uh, or re- referred to Shimon Gibson. I think that's a, is interesting. We have a relationship with him. He's not a Christian archaeologist, but he's 
a rather brilliant archaeologist, and I really appreciate his intellectual honesty as it relates to the final days of Jesus, you know, like he's not playing fast and loose with the archaeology or the historical records or mistreating the New Testament accounts, you know, it's, I don't know where he's at in terms of considering Christ, but at at least at, at this level, appreciating the the honesty and the work that he's done and to the benefit of the church. Yeah. Uh, you and, know. and I've read his book, The Final Days of Jesus, The Archaeological Evidence. And, um, and I will say this, he is one of those archaeologists who, at least in that book, I haven't read any of his other stuff, but at least in that book, it does treat the New Testament documents as historical documents. And, um, and I believe treats them with respect, um, yeah. the respect they deserve in my opinion. So, you know, I think he was very, very, um, very respectful and, and really trying to use them to look at different aspects, uh, archeologically. Yeah. And anybody who interacts with the new Testament, we want them to appreciate something greater than just that, right? Right. That's what we would ultimately want, but at least it's refreshing at this sort of human academic level to have that kind of thing. Cause yep. there's a lot of it out there that doesn't, you know? And so, uh, anyway, that's, it, that kind of jumped out at me as a, just an appreciation for that. Yep. So Jesus goes to Caiaphas, then he goes to Pontius Pilate, and then what happens next in the narrative? Well, he is handed over to be crucified. And uh, there are lots of written descriptions from the ancient world about Roman crucifixion. It was brutal. Um, it was effective. And it's no wonder that they crucified literally thousands and thousands of people. I say no wonder because in that time and uh, during during their reign, I can see why they did it. I don't agree with it, but I can, can understand why they would choose it as a as a deterrent for people, a public deterrent for other people by, by publicly executing people in just this way that was, was sheer torture. Archaeological evidence for crucifixion is, is much harder to come by, but there was a very important discovery made in 1968. Again, construction crew that actually accidentally dug up some tombs in Northeast Jerusalem discovered again, some ossuaries. And one of them was inscribed with the name Yehohanan, and it included the skeletal remains of, a, of an adult male. And the interesting thing is that it had a heel bone with a nail still embedded into it. So we have the, the heel bone of the crucified man is what it's, it's known as today. And the anthropologist who examined the remains determined he had been in his 20s when he was crucified sometime in the uh, early to mid first century. And um, what's interesting is, is looking at the heel bone, it appears that he would have been crucified with a leg on either side of the upright and the nail driven between kind of through the, through the side of his heel into the cross. Sometimes our, our modern drawings that we see, there's this little platform out front that the feet are put on, but, but this particular artifact would suggest that, uh, that Yehohanan was crucified with a leg on either side. Now they have, they may have crucified in, in various different manners and methods, um, depending on what was available at the time. But what's really interesting to me is that the heel bone of the crucified man, it illuminates the description of Jesus' crucifixion in scripture, but it counters the objections of some critics who have argued that Jesus would have been thrown into a mass grave for criminals. He wouldn't have been dignified with a proper burial in a, in a family tomb but we now know with, with this discovery that someone who was a criminal, who was sentenced to be crucified, could be dignified with a proper burial. And so even in, in something like this, you can see how it aligns and affirms a, just a, a little detail that's in the, the biblical narrative about the crucifixion of Jesus. Yeah, Brian, I love that apologetic point. Uh, think about the, think about the, the, the irony from the Roman perspective, yeah, we're going to, we're going to publicly crucify, uh, kill, uh, your, your citizens in the most horrible way possible. And then we'll allow you to have the dignity of burying them according to your own traditions. Right, so yeah. pat, pat on the head to you, you yeah. know, like <laughs> you just think about the sort of moral tension that's in that, you know, like, geez, uh, another thing that's interesting. I, I was just reading up on this, uh, 
that is, is to my knowledge, you correct me if I'm wrong, they did not find evidence that uh, the nails were driven through his either wrists or hands, which would indicate he was probably tied to the cross with that. And we, fi- I think that's in written records too. So there was varieties of uh, ways that they did it. Is that is that your understanding of the evidence, Brian? That is my understanding of it too. Yeah, there was yeah. even some. Uh, one of the first anthrop- uh, anthropologists who studied it uh, suggested there may have been evidence that um, the legs of Yehohanan may have been broken, but but subsequent studies have called that into question. So I don't use that anymore as uh, okay. as any um, as any evidence. But if you read some of the older books on it, you'll see that claim made as well. But it, some of the more recent studies suggest that may not have been the case. Okay. Um, so, and that would mean that he died before that was necessary to break his legs. Yeah, because oftentimes they, they just let them hang there for days until they died. Jesus' legs were not broken. The other criminals' legs were broken because the Passover was coming. And so you had to get the bodies off quickly for that. And when they came to Jesus, he, of course, was was already dead. And, and so just to make sure they they stabbed him. Um, with the spear, yes, and yes, out, yes. out ran yes. blood and water, which I always find really fascinating. That it's Doctor Luke who records that very yeah. interesting piece of evidence, which uh, medical doctors today will tell you is is evidence that he was already already dead, just as the Gospels describe. Yeah, it's such an extraordinary detail, isn't it? Right? You mentioned Doctor Luke, and he's not a primary eyewitness. Luke is a, a human at the human level, a secondary witness who's gone around and collected all this evidence. And to the degree that he gets that detail, right? Yes. Now, ultimately, yeah. the, whole, the Holy Spirit is authoring this text, but there's the human dimension to scripture here that kind of comes to the fore of, of Luke's peculiar is the wrong word, but, but like God is using his personality to draw something out that he wants us to know. And using Luke for that purpose, I I just find it extraordinary. Yeah, and has have there been? This isn't the only evidence of crucifixion that's been found. The only nail in a bone, right? Am I remembering that right? There are a few. The most recent one was a couple of years ago, and it was discovered, I believe, in Britain. The issue with the other two or three that have been discovered is that they're from a later time period. Yeah, the okay. second or third century. Uh, the the thing about this particular discovery, which makes it so important, is it, it's dated to um, between AD 7 and AD 66. So, so right in the same time frame of Jesus' crucifixion, which is why it's, it's uh, another yeah. reason it's so yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the other evidence shows just sort of the general widespread use of crucifixion all the way in Britain, right? But uh, yeah, yeah, the dating yeah. here is really, and in Jerusalem, of course. And one of my favorite names, the precinct that was founded, Givat Ha Mivtar. I just love to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so has there been any other evidence? I know you mentioned that there wasn't a ton of evidence for crucifixion, but we have the nails. Is there any other evidence in general that describes crucifixion or, I mean, it's it's written in texts, but. Yeah. So, well, the ne- the next the next one is interesting because. It's called the Alex Amenos Graffito, and it's 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 archaeological, more archaeological evidence for the early belief in the crucifixion of Jesus. In 1857, there was a structure uh, called the Domus Gelatina. It was discovered uh, near the Palatine Hill in Rome, and it had a piece of graffiti inscribed in the plaster on one of the walls in the rooms. Now, it's been dated to about 200 A.D., and it clu- includes the image of a man with a donkey's head hanging on a cross and a person in front of it raising his hands as if in worship. And the inscription reads, Alexa Menos worships his God. And, and what's interesting about this is it appears to be, um, I, I think the general consensus is that the interpretation of this is that there was somebody, a Christian named Alexa Menos, who was known to be a follower of Jesus and someone is mocking him by inscribing this frankly blasphemous picture of Jesus on a cross. If you, if you want to mock the God that someone was worshiping, how, what better way to do it than to draw a man with a donkey's head. And so this, this, this blasphemous image of, of Jesus on a cross 
and this inscription that says, uh, Alexamenos worships his God. And so what what's interesting is that it may be the earliest depiction, albeit a blasphemous one, of the crucifixion of Jesus this, uh, in terms of art, uh, if you can call this, this scratched piece of graffiti art. But what's, <laughs> what's really interesting is that uh, it dates very early, 200 AD, and, um, and most scholars, I believe, would, would link it to the crucifixion that somebody is just mocking Alexamenos for his worship of, of the crucified Jesus. Yeah, so I guess blasphemous art uh, is nothing new. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, right, right. We've seen this in Western, more of a proliferation in the dechristianization of the West. It's more of it now, right? It's more overt, more blasphemous, but uh, certainly nothing new under the sun, right, Brian? No, and you know, the irony here, though, is that somebody is trying to mock Jesus on a cross, and here we are 2,000 years later going, oh, look at that. That's evidence that people, <laughs> people— Almost you know, 1,800 years ago, believed Jesus died on a cross. And so um, it's almost like the tables get turned on it. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I just popped in my head, Genesis 50, I think it's verse 20. Uh, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good, right? So the person inscribing that, of course, had no idea. That's right. Well, yeah, it's a hostile witness. Uh, right. So that, that's always a, a helpful thing. And if you want to think of it in courtroom terms, the other part of this, this is all the way in Rome. And it's dated around 200. Now, one of the things that's floating out there is the uh, the argument that, you know, I'm reminded of the, there was this P special on PBS years ago, 15 years ago, from Jesus to Christ, okay? The whole implication of the whole series is Jesus was just a rabbi and he became the Messiah slash God in Christian theology yeah. later, okay? So here we have just an ordinary dude what, a thousand miles from Israel? Yep. Inscribing this thing, making fun of his neighbor. Yeah. So it shows you the organic nature of the belief that Jesus was God, that he was worshiped. And, uh, you know, this is not some person in the church who has control over the theology. It's just an ordinary citizen. Uh, I find that extraordinary. And uh, it fits with what our argument would be about. Mm -hmm. The nature of what the church believed right from the beginning. Yeah, you know another thing interesting for talking about depictions in artistic depi depictions of Jesus on the cross. Um, one thing that I, I learned relatively recently uh, when Notre Dame burned to the ground a few years ago is that Notre Dame they have a piece of or what they consider to be the crown of thorns. And then if you follow the prominence of where the crown of thorns appears in history, it was, it goes back to like, and I forget the, the date, but definitely during the medieval period, at some point it gets sold to, you know, it's in Italy or something that gets sold to France because someone needed funding for the crusades or something. Oh, maybe it was Constantinople. That's what it was. Anyway, by the time it gets to France around that time period in the medieval time period is when Jesus starts to be depicted on the cross in artwork with the crown of thorns on, whereas prior to that point in history, depictions of Jesus in artwork on the cross, there is no crown of thorns. And so they did that because they wanted to drum up tourism for people to come pilgrimage to see the crown of thorns in their relics. And so that's interesting. I, yeah. I thought that that was interesting. I mean, as, when I grew up, it's like, oh, yeah, of course he had the crown of thorns on his head because I've seen it in pictures. But the text doesn't say if he had it on or not. It's just. Yeah. Interesting clues sometimes in, in artwork. You know, obviously this artwork going back much further. But, yeah, I think that whole realm I don't know much about. But I, I think it, that's a whole field of study I'm sure that people have pursued. All right. Well, what's what's next in the the story of Jesus? Well, Jesus was buried. In a tomb. Now, there are three tombs in Jesus that are purported to be the final resting place. There is the Talpiot tomb, which, in my opinion, has the least evidence in its favor. And without getting into details, people can go to my website. I have a, a blog, Three Tombs of Jesus, which is the real one. Um, the, the second tomb of Jesus is the one that most Protestants go to when they're there, and that is the uh, Gordon's tomb or the garden tomb, as it's called. And it is a beautiful, beautiful site. 
in these beautiful gardens and um and it's a tomb the problem with it is that it's it's not a was in the first century was not the new tomb in which no man had ever laid that scripture says that's an iron age tomb and we know that because just on the other side of the wall there's a french uh, is it a library or a school there and there are more of the tombs from that complex there and uh, gabby barkai who is one of the greatest one of the greatest archaeologists, period, Israeli archaeologists, but certainly experts on tombs, has been pretty clear this whole complex is an Iron Age tomb. But the tomb that does have the best evidence, archaeologically written testimony, is the tomb that is within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, if you've ever been to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you will know that it doesn't look much like a tomb. You go into the church and kind of in the, there's this, um, area that has this, what's called an edicule, this uh, marble structure that has been built around the purported tomb of Jesus. And there, there's a, a slab on the burial bed and you wait your turn to get in to spend about 30 seconds to a minute in there before you have to get out for the next people to go in. And so I have a friend, Nate, who says, uh, who likes to say the, um, the tomb in, in the garden tomb is the right feel, but the wrong tomb. And the tomb in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is likely the right tomb, but the wrong feel. And so um, I think the evidence for it, both the written evidence, um, Eusebius records that the Emperor Hadrian in the second century built a huge platform over this quarry and constructed a temple to Venus or Aphrodite over the tomb of Christ. Jerome affirms this. And then Eusebius, during his lifetime, writes that the Emperor Constantine destroyed the Roman temple excavated through the fill of Hadrian's platform, found the tomb of Jesus. This new structure was built there. And um, during restorations to the edicule that took place uh, a number of years ago, just a few years ago, they removed the burial bed for the first time in almost 500 years, that marble slab that was over the bed where they would have laid the body. Mortar samples from the structure surrounding the tomb were tested, and they confirmed that it was built in the mid-4th century. Uh, and then rebuilt in, uh, the, as a crusader chapel in the Middle Ages. Um, and, and all of this kind of affirms the known history of that particular site. And archaeologist John McRae wrote, although absolute proof of the location of Jesus' tomb is beyond our reach, the archaeological and early literary evidence argues strongly for those who associate it with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yeah, I love that, Brian. I, I agree with you. Over the years, I've I've grown more not certain, but more inclined to think that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is probably the right location. I mean, what el- what other options are there? Uh, I don't need. I don't even know if there is other options. Yeah. But I like what you said about the Garden Tomb too. I just tell a real quick story. The first time I ever went to Israel, went to the Garden Tomb with a tour group, and there was a man there, wa- a guide leading us around, and he was talking about uh, some some skeptic or somebody said to him that Jesus was a wimp because. He died on the cross too quickly, you know, before the Romans broke his legs. And I can remember he locked eyes, just happened to lock eyes with me. And tears started coming down his cheeks. He says, my Jesus was no wimp. Hmm. Yeah. And you reminded me of that. And that's that's certainly true. Uh, but it reminded me of the existential experience at the garden tomb. It's not the right place. Yep. It's just It's just not. But you can experience something there, uh, and many people have, and that was my experience there. I'll never forget that man. I don't know why he locked eyes with me, but it, it almost brings me to tears just to think about it now. Yeah, and, and I think that's the value of the garden tomb, is that it's probably the closest that we have in Jerusalem to what the tomb of Jesus may have been like in a garden, the serenity of that particular area. Yes, even though it's not the right site, it certainly is a great place to contemplate and meditate yeah. uh, on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, just a, a, a thought, over the years, I had been sort of, eh, I'm not so sure about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but as I got more knowledge about this, this uh, the platform built in the second century by Hadrian and all that, that really sort of like made me think, oh, well, that that makes total sense that they would just deliberately desecrate this with this pagan temple. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that really struck me as really good evidence uh, 
uh, as part of a chain of evidence getting you back further yeah. in time. So we should also make one more statement. Sometimes people say it can't be the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because it wasn't outside the the walls, and Jesus was was crucified outside the city. But it it certainly was out. That's been proven. The the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was outside of the first century walls of Jerusalem, mm. and so. Um, it certainly does fit that particular piece of, of evidence from the scriptures. Okay. Well, if the uh, the tomb of Jesus location wasn't controversial enough, <laughs> I see the next thing that's coming up on your list. And I know this one is, people are split on this one. So tell us about it. Sure. It's the Shroud of Turin. And I, uh, in the past, if, if people who follow my work, they know I've, I've typically avoided using the Shroud of Turin. I've, I've avoided things that are highly controversial in the sense of lacking the same type of evidence that other, other artifacts do. However, um, there have been a number of studies recently that I think um, have convinced me to at least uh, state this. First of all, the Shroud is a linen burial cloth, and it, it's very famous. It bears the negative image of a crucified man. And some people have said what most people know about it when they hear about it, they think of the the tests that were done in the 1980s, I believe, that came out to say it's a medieval forgery. Of course, nobody can explain how in the world with medieval technology they would have come up with something like this. It's certainly not paint. They know that it's not paint. But most people just have are, are using outdated information. That's the point I'd like to make. And even the infamous 1988 radiocarbon dating of the sample of the shroud, which is what dated it to the Middle Ages, is shown to have been taken from a, a portion of it that was repaired in the Middle Ages. So the, the cotton fibers that they tested there very well would have tested to the Middle Ages. That's Nobody's arguing about that. The question is whether the shroud itself is authentic. So let me give give the two recent studies that I think have have at least convinced me that the shroud of Turin is an authentic burial shroud of a crucified man from the first century. I I can't say that it's Jesus. I don't know that I would even I would I would make that claim, but I will make the claim. I think the evidence suggests that it is an authentic burial shroud of a of a man from the first century in the Jerusalem area, I would even add, uh, based on some of the pollen samples that were taken from it. But um, one scientific study is is really interesting. In the scientific journal Plus One that analyzed the Shroud of Turin, and it discovered nanoparticles of blood. And what was interesting about this was, so we know it's blood, it's not paint that's there. But what was interesting is that these are, are highly specific nanoparticles that only occur in the blood of tortured victims, but are not typically found in the blood of normal people. And so you would expect, if this was an authentic burial shroud of someone who had been tortured and crucified by the Romans in the first century, that it would contain these nanoparticles. And when they did this uh, study, they found that it did indeed have those nanoparticles. Another study just in 2022 from Italy's Institute of uh, Crystallography in uh, the National Research in- Council concluded that the Shroud of Turin dates to the first century. It was interesting. They used a method called wide angle X ray scattering, which measures the structural degradation due to the natural aging of the cellulose that makes up the fibers in the linen threads. And this process is great because it's non destructive. And it was used on a variety of historical textiles that have well documented ages. And then compared with the results from the Shroud of Turin, and the best match was a piece of fabric from the middle of the first century, AD 55 55 to 74, which is known to have come from the siege of Masada in Israel. And so we now have new dating, which contradicts the earlier flawed dating from 1988. And so basically, two of the most recent studies have demonstrated, first of all, the ancient origin of this particular shroud that the the shroud itself, the linen fibers date to the middle of the first century. And secondly, that the shroud itself contains blood and specifically nanoparticles in that blood of someone who was tortured as you would expect a crucified person to be. And so because of those things, I think 
that this is an authentic burial shroud of a man who was crucified sometime in the first century. I'm not saying it was Jesus, but what's very interesting is it is a, it's helpful to illuminate crucifixion for us, if that's the case, because you can see where he was, this particular man was crucified, and he has uh, nail holes in his in his wrists, not his hands. And so that's interesting. And in, I believe it's the tops of his feet. So again, it could be different, the different form of, of crucifixion. And, and we have um, evidence of scourging. And so j- just things that illuminate the picture of crucifixion that we get from the gospels. Um, and so because of the most recent studies, I think it's an authentic shroud of a crucified person. And in that sense, illustrative of uh, for us and and illuminates the the gospel accounts of Jesus crucifixion. Yeah, that's really good, Brian. You know, when I first came to ABR, uh we we the ministry had published some stuff on the Shroud of Turin, you know, saying, "Hey, this is an artifact that should be investigated and studied and my our colleague Rick Lancer has been convinced of its authenticity for quite a long time. And I, when I joined the ministry, I was kind of like, okay, you know, I'm open-minded, but I don't really know much about it. And over the years, progressively, the more I read, the more I interact with our friend, John Long, who's been studying it for 40 years. We did a couple TV shows with him on it. The, the more evidence that comes out, the more the tail, the scales keep getting tilted in this direction for me. That's been my journey. It sounds like it's something similar for you. Yeah, uh, that yeah. you weren't you weren't willing to put this on any of your lists. Now you're willing to say this, especially this blood evidence and this new testing with this new scientific stuff. It's really interesting how we can sort of move, and we should move either away from a view or towards a view, depending on yeah how it unfolds. That's right. You go as as uh, Scott Stripling often tells us uh, at Sheila when we're excavating. You just go where the evidence leads. Yeah. You 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 work the process. You follow the evidence. So, uh, last thought on this, Brian. Any any concerns that uh, maybe that's not the right way to phrase it. Uh, I think sometimes people are concerned that we're going to fall into some kind of because we we're we're, we're investigating the shroud and claiming certain aspects of authenticity, we're going to fall into into some kind of weird idolatry or Roman Catholic mysticism or something like that. Maybe could you comment on that a little bit? Your, your, your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it's important that um, we don't worship artifacts. I mean, you think in the old Testament, the, the people, God's people sinned by worshiping the, the bronze snake hundreds of years later, right? They're still worshiping this artifact that was important. So I think an artifact can be important, but ought not to be yeah, worshiped. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I'm not claiming um, that this is the shroud of Jesus. Correct. I think I think that's an important distinction to make. Yeah. Um, there may be people who believe it is. I can't explain how a negative image of a person appeared on a on a shroud from the and first I'm century <laughs> in the first century and I'm not even prepared to speculate about that yes. but what I think the evidence has convinced me of is that it's an authentic shroud of someone who was crucified in the first century and so even just at that level it's it's important because it illuminates um the the scriptures for us yeah that that's really good so even if you stop there it's highly valuable, like all, all other archaeological evidence that we find like this. So good stuff, man. I, I think for me, it's, well, if it's not fake, like they had claimed that it was for so long, then what is it? Yeah. Like you, you still have that question, like, okay, well, you claim it's a forgery, but now that it's been proven that it's not a forgery, there's still this oh, what could it possibly be? Like, how did this, there's still, there's still questions. There, there, there's a little, there's yeah. a little bit of an Occam razor kind of thing here though, too. You know, it's kind of like, and I, I appreciate it. I'm not willing to say it's definitively the shroud of Jesus, but I have to admit I'm inching closer in that direction uh, because I, I can't think of, there may be another explanation, but no one's offered what it is at this point. Yeah. So, you know, maybe we'll never find out for sure. And archaeology can be that way, you know. It's the word of God is certain. Archaeology does have, or in this case, an artifact. There is a tentative nature to it. Yep. But I don't, I, I don't know what other options there are. 
Okay. If it's an ordinary dude, then how did the imagery get on there? Like that's, that's an yeah. extraordinary question, Yeah, but we can't belabor the point, Brian, because you have another artifact you want to talk about. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And this one's, this was hugely important. This is the Nazareth inscription. The Nazareth inscription is an edict from Caesar uh, inscribed on a marble slab. And what's interesting about it is that it imposes a death penalty in Israel for anyone caught removing bodies from family tombs and specifically mentioned our sepulcher sealing tombs, such as the one that Jesus was buried in. Now, we don't know a lot about its history. We know that it was acquired by uh, Wilhelm Froer in 1878, who simply recorded that it came from Nazareth. That's all we know. But the study of the inscription itself shows that it likely dates to the reign of Claudius, so 41 to 54 AD, and that it appears to be directed specifically at a Jewish audience. So it's quite extraordinary. What would cause Caesar to feel the need to make such a pronouncement that he is instituting a death penalty for anyone caught stealing bodies from the tomb? Now, listen, people, people broke into tombs and robbed out tombs in antiquity, but they didn't take the bodies. They took the grave goods that were had value. They, they didn't take the bodies. And so this is an extraordinary thing that happens. Now, of course, uh, people who read scripture are familiar that, that Matthew records the Jewish, rele- Jewish leaders were deliberately spreading the rumor, the lie that the disciples had stolen the body to explain the fact that the grave was empty. And, and I think this report likely reached the emperor who would have seen this new Christian sect as, as a, a dangerous anti-Roman movement. Now, I should also mention that, that just a couple of years ago, uh, there was an analysis of the marble from the tablet that the Nazareth inscription is on, and they determined that it came from the Greek island of Kos. And the authors of the study suggested that a different historical context for it that it was a different body that was desecrated, robbed, taken from a tomb and desecrated. And, and it was, I believe it was Caesar Augustus who was a much earlier time frame when this happened. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, Dr. Clyde Billington um, has analyzed their study, and he's done a lot of work on this particular inscription. And, and he points out serious problems with their hypothesis. And I should note that it's not surprising that the marble came from Kos. Marble is not naturally found in Israel. Almost all the marble inscriptions in Israel came from other places, many of them from Kos um, itself. And so the fact that the marble that the inscription is on came from a different place, that's neither here nor there. Dr. Billington concludes the context of the Nazareth inscription clearly proves it was written for Jews, not Gentiles, and that it was almost certainly issued by Claudius in response to the story of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth king of the Jews. And if that's the case, this is a huge discovery, a huge artifact that I think needs to be studied more in depth. And I think if this is true, certainly points to, is another witness to the resurrection of Jesus. I've always loved this one, Brian. Uh, You covered it very well. Uh, Always lots, lots of stuff to be intrigued about this one. Uh, one of the things is the type of tomb is specified in v- very clear terms. You mentioned this, this sepulcher ceiling tombs, you know, that's got, as Clyde has pointed out, Dr. Billington, you've pointed out, that's got, you know, first century uh, Judaism written all over it and a, and a number of other things. I, I, I just, it's another one of these discoveries that's kind of like, there's only a limited set of explanations for it that are possible. You know, Occam's razor, as I said earlier, I've always been convinced that this is a response to the preaching of the resurrection. I I haven't heard an alternative argument that even remotely moves me away from that view. And uh, the more I hear about it, the more convinced I am. You know, I'm not trying to be a dogmatist when I say that. We're trying to be, you know, judicious and weighing the evidence. But I I have trouble coming up with an alternative uh, for this one too. Yeah, and the alternative that was I read the I read the report the the study that was done a few years ago, and and then I read uh, Doctor Billington's response to it, and there were all kinds of problems with the other purported historical scenario that I and I would just direct people to to Doctor Billington's article on it. That to me it, it's it's was unconvincing that the 
and, and I admit my bias as, as a follower of Jesus, I fully admit my bias, but, but as, as much as I can, you know, I, I try in an unbiased way to look at the two scenarios that have been proposed. I, I think the resurrection of Jesus by far has the weightier evidence supporting it. Yeah. Uh, last, last thought too, is, uh, you know, the, it's the response to the preaching of the resurrection, right? So, in other words, Rome is upset about what's going on in the empire as it relates to this claim of this man from the dead, and this is a response to it. That would then leads you into the discussion of why the disciples were preaching the resurrection to begin with. Yeah. So it's a great entry point into the larger discussion about the historical evidence for the resurrection and explaining the empty tomb. This is an attempt to explain it in a way. They're saying the tomb was robbed which is exactly what the Jewish leaders told the guards to say, and they paid them to say it in Matthew 28, 27, whatever. I can't remember which one it is. So it's it's almost like this grand conspiracy, if you want to say it that way. I mean, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any stretch. But anyway, it, it does, for the person listening who might have reservations, I, I, we want to lead you into that reflection on the bigger issue here, and that is what happened to the body of Jesus? And uh, the extraordinary evidence that points to the only logical explanation, and that is he was raised from the dead. So the the story of Jesus, he's crucified, resurrected, and we've been following this evidence as you've been laying it out more chronologically. But this kind of leads us to the the final thing that's on your list. So what kind of happens after all this? Well, I think the the number one discovery for me, and, and even though we've done it chronologically, I really do think it is, is the manuscript evidence of the of the testimony uh, of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And and I should I'm going to start with with I think the most important and most accurate, which are the gospel records. And I think that that's important to note. Papyrus 66 is really interesting. Um, everybody, everybody wants to talk about Papyrus 52, which is a, a fragment of the Gospel of John, and it's a it's a very important fragment. It dates to the second century. Some people would place it about 125. I'm more comfortable just saying second century, but it's a fragment of John 18, and so it doesn't really describe anything about the death or resurrection of Jesus. But we, it tells us that you know by the mid second century at the least, that there were people who were copying and, and disseminating John's gospel. But Papyrus 66 is very interesting because it also dates to the second to third century. That's what they have dated it at from the, the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts um, is where I get the datings for this. And it is a near complete gospel of John. And I believe it is the earliest written record we have, um, the earliest manuscript from the New Testament that actually describes the death and resurrection of Jesus, because it's almost a near complete copy of John's gospel. And so it's very important for us. But we also have manuscripts that were non-biblical manuscripts that were written very early on that also testify to the same thing. Let's start with Josephus. Josephus, writing at about 8093, writes about Jesus and his death. Now, I, I need to just preface this with a little disclaimer. The most common version of this that people quote was almost certainly altered by a Christian scribe at some point in antiquity to make it sound more Christian because, for example, uh, Josephus, who was a Jew writing for the Romans, would never have claimed, I believe, that Jesus was the Messiah definitively. And so I think most scholars agree that it has been altered, but there's an Arabic version of it that doesn't contain those. And so whenever I quote Josephus, I quote the Arabic version of it because it, I believe, and, and I think a lot of scholars would agree that it is probably what Josephus would have written and is far more consistent with that. This is what Josephus wrote. At that time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah. 
concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. That is something that a, a Jew may have written, certainly one who was working for the Romans by this particular point uh, after the destruction of the temple. So this is important because it affirms many of the details of Jesus' death. It also affirms that people, the disciples, claimed that he had risen from the dead. And this is all within about 60 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. So it makes it an early, early testimony, very important one. And then the second so one- So before you get to the is, second one, so the difference between yeah. the Arabic version and the other version that we have is that Josephus says that he was the Messiah. Like, what was the difference? Yeah, so there, there are a number of things in it that the, in, the, in the original, uh, sorry, the, the widely disseminated one, which are sound like, a, a frankly, that a Christian scribe added a few extra things to really make Jesus look good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to make it look like Josephus was declaring him to be the Messiah. Yeah, okay. So it's the and Messiah was kind of like, the, he would never say it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In fact, what's interesting is that for years, scholars noted this and, and had tried to reconstruct what Josephus likely wrote if you took away the Christian interp interpolations from it. Okay. And then in the 1970s, this Arabic version was discovered and published. And wouldn't you know, it almost matched exactly what the scholars had thought Josephus might have written. And so okay. when I quote Josephus, I use the Arabic one yeah, because yeah. it's the one that most scholars would say has not been altered. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really good. That's really good. I didn't know that part about uh, the how they tried to reconstruct the text before the Arabic version was discovered. And you and you see that sometimes they do that with certain manuscripts of the Septuagint and so so forth and so on. And then when the Dead Scrolls scrolls were found, it vindicated reconstructions of the text. So here, so really that's double evidence in a way. Yeah, I was not aware of that. That's very good, Brian. Yeah, and then and then we have a very important uh, passage from Tacitus, uh, writing in eighty six one sixteen. So again, within a hundred years, less than a hundred years of Jesus' death and resurrection. He is writing about the great fire in Jerusalem and uh, rumors that Nero started it because he wanted to burn out people who, um, he, whose land he wanted to build uh, a better Rome and a better palace for himself. So that's kind of the context for it. And it's Tacitus writes, consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, it's the Latin from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for a moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of this evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. What I find interesting about this quote is that not only does he affirm Christ's crucifixion, during the reign at the hands of Pontius Pilate, but he also mentions a most mischievous superstition that that broke out after this. And I believe that that's a reference that, that Tacitus is making to the resurrection of Jesus. It would have been seen as a superstition um, as people went around the empire going, we saw him alive. He didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And so manuscript evidence I believe is very important because it demonstrates uh, the reliability of the gospels and it also helps us to understand that the death and resurrection of Jesus are rooted in history are written about by people not just with religious motivations as someone suggests that the new testament writers have but also what we might consider hostile witnesses Josephus Tacitus a Jew and a Roman and so um I think it's important for us to understand that there is a that this is a historical event that we're talking about, um, and so when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, I think we can do so confidently, knowing that Jesus came, that he lived, that he died, and that he rose again, and that because of that, forgiveness is now available for us because the Bible tells us that something amazing happened at the cross when Jesus died; that God punished him for all of the wrong things that we had done. And then when Jesus rose from the dead, he conquered sin and death and the grave. Listen, if Jesus came and promised eternal life and died and stayed dead, 
that promise is worthless. But Jesus came and promised eternal life, died, but then rose again. Listen, someone who conquers the grave and promises eternal life, now that's a promise I'm willing to bank my life on. I'm not going to add anything to that (laughs) because that was fantastic, Brian. Fantastic. All right, Brian, happy Easter. Yeah, you too. Take care, guys. God bless. Make sure you check out BibleArchaeologyReport.com if you want to see some more info on all these things that we talked about today. So that's all we have. Until next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.